Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Dr. Bill Culp for being willing to participate on this as well. So uh, Dr. Culp is a veterinary oncologic surgeon. Uh, and the reason I was excited to have him participate is that those folks are the main, uh, obviously surgeons are the main recipients of our work output as pathologists. And so uh, my main goal for having him participate is to get the um, sort of unvarnished opinion of surgeons as to this reporting. Um, so just so that folks know, the presentation is my output. I don't blame him for what's in here. Uh, all eggs and rotten vegetables should be thrown my way, not his. Um, but I, uh, Bill, if you want to chip in at any time to, to pop in, please go ahead. And if you, um, I, I will be, uh, asking you a couple of things during the course of this to get your opinions on, on how that works. So just so folks have an idea about this. So I wanted to give this as more of an introduction to synoptic reporting as a basis for discussion. This is not something that's been talked about a lot in veterinary medicine, but it's a major factor in human medicine. Uh, and I think there's a lot of benefits that, that we could reap from uh, implementing this to a greater degree in our workflows. So I want to start by talking about what is an ideal pathology report. So our goal as pathologists is to communicate important information unambiguously to our clients, to make important information obvious and easy to interpret. Uh, although many of us, myself included, are experts at making information obscure and uh, uh, tricky to find. Uh, ideally, a path report would provide a way for easy automated parsing of reports for future studies so that we can take the information that we generate and be able to apply it to future work. Um, ideally, we'd standardize reporting to make sure that important pieces of information are communicated, that we don't forget anything, and that it would convey a level of certainty in the information presented. So traditional pathology reports, the ones we're all familiar with, we've all trained in, uh, Jay and her group do a great job of teaching in the descriptive vet path course every year, are narrative. And in general, they're pathologist dependent. We all do roughly the same things, but we all do it differently in a different order. Uh, I have had a number of fights with my colleagues here because uh, just because there's no right way to do it doesn't mean that the way they do it is not wrong. Um, and there's no standardization. So uh, my report is going to look different than uh, someone else's report. Uh, and just to ask uh, Dr. Culp, have you ever played the game where you take a pathology report and start reading it to someone and see if you can figure out which pathologist wrote it without reading the signature line? I haven't tried that yet, but I like that. I think we might have to bring that up at our tumor boards next time. I recommend it because I guarantee you if I'm reading a report if they take the signature line off, I can tell it's my report in the first sentence compared to some other folks. And uh, for some of my colleagues, if I look at the comment section, if it's more than half a page, then I can tell who wrote it as well. So uh, you can get a lot of information about who the pathologist is based on how they write the reports. And that's because there's no standardization. We all do things a little differently. All right, and this is an example report that I wrote. It's completely made up. Um, but this would be a, a typical path report for me. Uh, and so I guarantee there's about half of the audience now who just had their hackles go up because they can't stand the way I write this. And that's fine. Uh, you're all wrong, but that's fine. Um, and, and what I want to just briefly note is it's, uh, there's a lot of important information in here. And we all know that. Um, but it's fairly difficult to find in the report. So um, intracellular granules that are metachromatic via GIM sustaining. Uh, so that's a mast cell tumor. The mitoses are here. Um, eosinophils in the tissue. And then sample margins here at the end. Um, but all that information is dispersed throughout the report. Come on, Zoom, work with me here. Okay, hold on. 
let's do that. Okay, um, these are other examples. So some of these are examples from human medicine, others of them are examples from veterinary medicine, but uh, the report could be as short as completely excised infundibulocystic basal cell carcinoma. Um, but you've got location, you've got the what kind of mass it is and completeness of excision. And then again, something similar here. Uh, so depending on who's writing it and how extensive the report is, the report may be very short, it may be very long, uh, it may have different pieces of information, it's all kind of all over the place. But there are a lot of advantages to the narrative format. So depending on the pathologist, the narrative report can provide a good baseline for comparison of future samples. And this is something that we've used for a long time um, because if one sample gets sent to one lab and another sample gets sent to another lab, all you have is the pathology report on the second sample to say, is this truly the same mass as the, the first excision or is this something new? Has it changed? How have things altered? Uh, the narrative report is generally complete. It describes the entire sample that we get. And everyone's used to this. I mean, everybody uh, from surgeons, pathologists, we all know this format. We're all used to this format. So everybody is on the same page with this one. Um, it's, it's sort of become the standard. Problems with this, depending on the pathologist, it can be potentially time consuming, uh, especially as you get started uh, now most of us can write a report for a mast cell tumor in no time at all using only about 5% of our brain because we've written so many mast cell tumor reports over the years. So again, depending on the mass and the pathologist, it's more or less time consuming, but it is very information dense. We're packing a lot into a small amount of space and the information that's in there is somewhat devoid of context because it's all packed into our narrative report. And finally, the narrative report is non-standard. I, I don't know if any of you have tried to take reports and get information out, but without sitting there reading each report and extracting the information manually into a separate spreadsheet or something like that, it's almost impossible to get information out of those reports to be able to use for future research studies or to determine prognosis or, or grading schemes, that sort of thing. It takes a tremendous amount of work to get that information back out into a format that's usable for future work. So looking at the traditional report that we all write versus what my concept of an ideal pathology report is, they do a fairly good job of communicating important information unambiguously, not perfect, but fairly good. Not a great job of making important information obvious and easy to interpret because it's buried in a paragraph of text. Uh, it does a terrible job of uh, automating parsing of reports for future work. There's no standardization. Uh, although individual, and to be fair, individual labs may have their own standard format or standard template. So depending on the lab you're at, there may be standardization, but overall there's no uh, standardized reporting. But it, our reports generally do a pretty good job of conveying level of certainty and in information. We, we do a pretty good job of saying, eh, I don't know, or it's probably this, but. Um, and the narrative format lends itself to that sort of information communication. So uh, there are possible modifications to, to traditional reports. We could just go with a morphologic diagnosis and comments. And obviously that's worse because it gets rid of all the information. So it's a lot more standardized um, and it's fairly easy to parse because there's just the morphologic diagnosis, but it gets rid of all the information we would probably be interested in, like uh, information about mitosis, anesthesitosis, anesthesiosis, that sort of thing. Uh, and then we can add diagnostic codes that makes searching to find reports easier, um, but what diagnostic code set do you use? SNVDO, SNOMED CT, uh, custom diagnostic code sets. Uh, the, the possibilities are endless. Um, and diagnostic codes don't always do a great job of communicating level of certainty. There's concerns about how much work do you put in to create a diagnostic code, and that makes things difficult. 
So synoptic reporting. Now I'm, I, I realize I'm several slides in and now I'm actually talking about the subject of the talk, but synoptic reporting started in the late 1980s in human medicine and it requires reporting specific items that are called data elements in a required format, which is called a response. And that sounds really complicated and I promise that it's not. I'll get to that in just a second. Um, but the College of American Pathologists started encouraging synoptic reporting more than 20 years ago, published, started publishing specific protocols for synoptic reporting 10 years ago, and now requires that um, initial biopsies on masses that have a synoptic report format are reported in a synoptic format for at least five years. And if you don't have a, a certain percentage of your reports, somewhere around 95 percent of your reports of first-time diagnoses in a mass uh, reported out by a synoptic format, uh, you will lose CAP accreditation, which means that you lose Medicare and Medicaid funding. So for the MDs, this is a huge thing um, that has become a major part of their uh, pathology workflow. And this is an example of a synoptic report. So this would be a, a fairly detailed synoptic report. But when we talked, uh, when I talked about data elements and responses, this is all that means. Mass size is a data element. It's a piece of information. And then this is the response. So the response is three by two by two centimeters and gross measurement. So data element and response, the biopsy type is excisional. So it, it does a fairly good job of of breaking out pieces of information that are significant and highlighting them uh, fairly quickly. This is another example. It's based on a human synoptic report. Um, so this has signalment for the patient, height, weight, and BMI, uh, the procedure, partial nephrectomy, and then information about the tumor here. So this, these pieces of information would be specified in the synoptic report template put out by CAP. And as a final example, uh, this website is a website for MD pathologists, but one of the pieces of information they have on their site is they have a web tool that lets you fill out human, the, the CAP synoptic protocols for all the variety of tumors that CAP has protocols out for. So I picked uveal melanoma, but uh, this gives you an idea about the kind of things that they're asking. You might notice mitotic count isn't on here. And so they've dropped things that don't involve prognosis. So things that we would think are fairly common, if they aren't involved in prognosis, then they are not on the CAP protocols. And so this would be an output from that. This is what the Synoptic, the synoptic report generated from this would look like. Uh, and then again, uh, this is an example from CAP's website of some of their protocols. So they have a protocol for ductal carcinoma in situ in breast cancer for resections, for biopsies, invasive carcinoma, resection and biopsy. So some of these get fairly specific while others of them are fairly broad. So for brain, they have one protocol for pretty much all, all the CNS tumors. So for breast cancers, they have very specific protocols for individual um, excisions. And for CNS tumors, they've got one broad one for most of the CNS tumors. And then uh, I have a couple of examples that I wanted to show live. And so I think I'm gonna have to stop sharing here a minute. And Okay, now this was something that went not great the last time. So how readable is the website? Can everyone see the, the web browser here? Looks good, okay. So on the website, we have a couple of examples of synoptic reports. I have a minimal example here. Just gonna, uh, sorry, hold on one second. Let 
me try that again. No, my apologies, folks. Okay, let me, there we are. All right, I can't get rid of the header. I apologize. Uh, I was trying to lose that, but. Um, uh, so this would be an example synoptic report generator. We could put Mike, in Mike, a I'm growth. sorry, before you get too far down, there's lots of comments saying that the, your screen was clearer initially and when whatever you did in the beginning to change it made it blurry. So, okay, is this uh, better? Or I can try that. Uh, I think that they better. said stop the video optimized view that maybe that's what did it. I, I just did. Perfect. Everybody says better. Yes. Okay, great. Okay. Is it large enough? I, everyone says perfect, so okay. Right. Make it a little larger here. Okay, so this is designed to generate a complete pathology report, not just the synoptic components, but um, uh, so I'm going to say that uh, in our example, the submitter actually inked it. Uh, there is no tumor at the margins. Um, there is lymphovascular invasion, and uh, we have neoplastic cells and less than five. We have 12 mitoses per 2.37. I will put that in there. All right, so uh, th again, this is a very simple um, synoptic format generator that could be used for just about any tumor. Um, but when we click that, it generates a synoptic component of the report up here and then provides the rest of this down here. So uh, like I said, this is a very simple um, example that could be used for just about anything. To give you a better idea about if we went more complicated, and I apologize that I have to, I should have bookmarked this, but um, uh, this would be one for an anal sac adenocarcinoma. And again, this is completely an example, has not been peer reviewed in any way. Uh, but they've sent us left and right anal sacs. Uh, we inked this one. It's a solid subtype. There's neoplasia at the margin, uh, focus of uh, infiltration into the peripheral connective tissue and periorectal musculature. Um, we didn't identify lymphovascular invasion. We didn't see necrosis seven mitoses, pleomorphism, and nuclear pleomorphism. Uh, and these are based on specific papers that list those as important prognostic factors in diagnosing these tumors, uh, just FYI. And again, prognostic factor here, and we happen to do ECAD. None as comments is short even for me, but there you go. So here we've got the synoptic report again. So it takes the elements that were put in specifically, generates this, um, breaks it out, and then puts the narrative components at the end there. Okay. Now I'll bring PowerPoint back, I hope.
Okay. Uh, is PowerPoint back for everyone? Let me make sure. Yes, but you're on presenter view. Really? Okay. How about now? Perfect. Good, okay. Okay. So advantages of the synoptic reporting. Uh, one of the main advantages of synoptic reporting for pathologists is that it ensures completeness of reports. Because it's a checklist-like format, it presents pathologists with all the needed data elements that you should have for a given type of tumor. So it means that we don't have to remember um, for, um, for anal sac adenocarcinomas. Okay, ECAD expression that's more than 75% of the tumor is prognostic and, and that sort of thing. Those pieces of information that are, are important and prognostic are in that particular report format. So it, it offloads us from having to remember every prognostic factor for every tumor in every animal other than Homo sapien. Um, and in one meta-analysis in human medicine, uh, 20, or 32 out of 33 studies showed that synoptic reports were statistically significantly more complete than narrative reports for the same types of tumors in the same institutions. Uh, synoptic reports allow for automated data collection because a computer can easily go in with that table format and extract the data element and the response. Um, and so that lets you go through a large number of reports quickly and pull out information that's significant. And in human medicine, they've reported an increased ease of interpretation and increased satisfaction. So the, the, the clinicians who are receiving reports have more satisfaction and find the reports easier to interpret. In addition, the pathologists that are looking at older reports have found that those reports are easier to interpret as well. Um, Sorry, Mike, just one quick, we've got a couple of people reporting that it's blurry again. So I don't know if, if you can go back and de-optimize per video again or, or what's going I, on. I can. How's that, better? Okay. Okay. Um, and so, um, studies of physicians and pathologists in Canada found that both groups were able to find information in synoptic reports more easily, found that synoptic reports facilitated a more consistent approach to interpretation of diagnostic and prognostic factors and had higher overall satisfaction among clinicians. Pathologists are a little iffier and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, challenges in synoptic reporting. The first and, and biggest challenge for us in veterinary medicine is the lack of standardization. So we have very few conditions that have well-documented prognostic factors that we really have a consensus on. Um, and even fewer studies look at objective factors versus subjective factors in prognosis. And I think all of us as pathologists have looked at a variety of the grading scales that are out right now. The one I always think of is the chondrosarcoma grading scale where it says, uh, uh, anisocaryosis, mild, moderate, significant, or anisocytosis, mild, moderate, significant, or uh, amount of matrix, small, moderate, large. Well, what does that mean? Uh, what, what, what are we going for with that? That my moderate may be somebody else's small or large for that matter. So uh, not having a set of objective prognostic factors for given tumors makes it difficult to standardize on what should be in a report. The checklist format can also provide an unwarranted degree of confidence in the diagnosis um, because it, you step through that as boxes, it makes it hard to tell how uncomfortable are we as pathologists with a given diagnosis. And this is actually one of the criticisms in human medicine that clinicians have had for synoptic reports, which is they find it more difficult to determine the experience level or the expertise of a pathologist for a given tumor because 
everything comes in into the same checklist format, whether it's somebody with 30 years of experience or whether it's a resident who started three weeks ago. And so it's, it's a little more difficult there um, from the clinician's end to determine who's reading this sample out and, and how comfortable do they feel with the diagnosis. So there's a lot of ways around that. Do we use synaptic reports only when we are confident in our diagnosis? which brings up the question, how confident do you have to be? Are 90%, 95%? Do you have no question in your mind that this is absolutely this tumor? Or do we add in a way to communicate uncertainty? So we use the synoptic format when there's a likelihood it's this kind of tumor, but then we have something that says, eh, probably, or maybe. And then the question becomes, how do we wanna do that? Do we wanna have just a flag that says, presumptive diagnosis, meaning, and what does that mean? It's more than 50% likely it's this, but do we want to have a, a, you know, mild, moderate, severe? There's a lot of ways we can go. We just need to, as a profession, decide how we want to communicate with that. There was a lot of concern brought up uh, in initial discussions about this sort of thing, uh, about resident training, because ACVP testing doesn't use synoptic format. Uh, although, if any of you, like myself, a couple of times ran short on time during the ACVP test, uh, we end up going to a synoptic format if you run out of time. Because if you bullet point things, you get most of the points. You're going to lose the organization and clarity points, but you're going to get most of the points on the question anyway. So uh, in some ways, you could fully do synoptic reporting on ACVP boards and still get most of the points. But there's a concern that if ACVP requires narrative reporting for the test, how do we make sure residents get significant amounts of that if we are switching to a synoptic format? Um, and I think there's lots of ways around that. First of all, synoptic reporting doesn't have to be yes or no. We can include narrative reports as part of a, uh, with synoptic uh, reports. Oh, and somebody said they thought they got rid of clarity or style points. Maybe they did. Maybe I'm not uh, up to date. I know the last couple or the last exam, last couple of exams were multiple choice, but um, but I think synoptic reports right now would only be applicable to neoplasias, uh, neoplasms. So we could get plenty of experience in narrative reporting with non-neoplastic reports. Uh, we could also uh, have plenty of narrative reports in other formats, so rounds and that sort of thing. I, again, I think there's ways around that. We just need to figure out how we want to deal with that. Uh, there's a concern from pathologists, and this is true from human medicine as well, uh, about the length of time needed to create a synoptic report. Um, but in human medicine, when they've implemented synoptic reports, many of the concerns were about technology issues rather than with the reporting format itself. And in general, they found that synoptic reports don't increase turnaround time. So it doesn't seem like it's taking pathologists longer to get the reports put out. So it's not taking them longer to actually write. Um, and then there's a lack of software support. So right now, no veterinary laboratory information management system supports synoptic reporting that I know of. Uh, and I've looked at a lot of them. <laughs> Uh, but you can use any word processor to implement synoptic reporting. Uh, you don't need specialized software. All you need to do is have the data element, some kind of separator, and the response. So it could be as easy as the data element, a tab, and the response. Data element, a colon, and the response. Data element, comma, and response. Um, there, there are lots of ways to put that in. and. Uh, go ahead and uh, deal with that without specific software. Now that said, specific software can decrease the amount of time it takes significantly. I'll also say that um, for College of American Pathologists, when we talk about synoptic reporting, uh, they consider it completely acceptable to print out their synoptic template and fill it in by hand. That would be an acceptable synoptic report as far as CAP is concerned. Um, so you don't need a computer at all. We could have a template that was put in uh, that was all done on paper. Um, but 
Again, having a computerized template can make it easier because it can separate required and optional components. It can walk you through, for example, when you say there's no tumor present at the margin, the computer pops up things asking you, what are the distance from the tumor to the margin? So that sort of thing can make it easier. Um, and we can use tools like the website to produce that and paste that into a, a word processor or a LIMS to get that final report. And finally, there's a lack of awareness. Um, I mean, I wasn't aware of synoptic reporting until a couple of years ago, and very few people have heard of this, have any idea what's going on with it. Um, and so there's always a, a reluctance to change as well. We've always done it this way and it works. And in a lot of ways, that's true. So I think we have a lot of hurdles to overcome to implement synoptic reporting in veterinary medicine. I don't think any of them are unsurmountable. I think it just takes a lot of um, introspection on our part to figure out which way would be helpful. And like I said, this does not have to be a one way or the other. Um, you can include what I guess I would call a hybrid format, but you can have a synoptic component at the top and then have a narrative component at the bottom. So uh, for future uh, considerations, there's a real need for clinicians and pathologists to get together to obtain consistent standardized data and to develop protocols for specific conditions. So obviously this ties in with a lot of the other presentations that have been going on with the VCGP group, standardizing mitotic counts, standardizing necrosis measurements, determining factors that are important for diagnosis and prognosis, which comes straight back to outcome assessment. Um, making sure that this is done in a standardized manner so that everybody's doing the same thing the same way. Um, and then establishing a repository for protocols to uh, allow for easy access um, and standardizing terminology. So trying to get everybody on the same page as far as how do we uh, report this out. Um, the repository is important so that everybody has access to the checklists. Um, and if we can create a standardized format, then I think we're more likely to get buy-in from the manufacturers of lab uh, information management systems to incorporate into their software packages. Um, and this comes to the biobank. If we have a collection of tissues um, or cases, then it makes it a lot easier to develop these things because we can evaluate the prognostic value of, of several of these as well. Um, and then establishing training corpuses for future computational pathology um, uh, protocols, because then the, proto the output of those protocols can be placed into the synoptic reports as well. Um, and finally, uh, in standardizing terminology, uh, we need to make sure we use specific terms for data elements rather than free form text because uh, if it's, and this is a completely fabricated example, but mitoses, if we have, uh, do we wanna say mitoses are present? Do we wanna say they're detected? But if, if everybody can pick their own terms, then we can't use that to extract in an automated fashion. Uh, the, there are ways to drive that um, in human medicine, they found that it's, it's pretty important to have, instead of having present and not present, having words that are completely different, present and absent, so that people who are reading through a report quickly don't see the present and miss the not part in front of it, um, because that's something that happens on a not too infrequent basis. Um, do we wanna add on free text descriptors in areas where we have standardized terminology so that if something doesn't fit quite right, you pick the best category and then have something else to modify that? Um, that's gonna, how we do this is gonna require input from human factors specialists, for instance, the present, not present versus present and absent, as well as pathologists and clinicians. And uh, as we all know, if you get, five pathologists in a room, you're gonna get six opinions. So trying to get all of us to agree on things is gonna be difficult, but I think if we can get something all of us can live with, even if we don't agree, um, I think we'll be taking a major step forward. Uh, and ultimately we need to look at data interchange. So uh, there's a lot of ways to do that and I'm not gonna get into all of these methods, but um, 
in human medicine, they've already had these problems and solved most of them. Um, and in some of those solutions, they've incorporated veterinary add-ons. So uh, LOINC is a system that allows you to describe a laboratory test so that you can say, this is the test that my lab does. Um, and to give you an example, uh, they have veterinary tests in here as well. So this uh, LOINC code 22912-0 is bovine herpes virus 1 antigen presence in tissue by immunostaining. Uh, HL7 is information interchange between computer systems. And if you've ever read the HL7 standard, then you've probably gone insane like I have. Um, and then SNOMED CT is coding of diseases with relationships. Um, but it, it allows you to say, when you have this code, it specifies that this is a neoplasm, it's in the duodenum, it's a gastrointestinal stromal tumor, that's part of the gastrointestinal tract, uh, that sort of thing. So there's a lot of um, uh, there's a lot of standards that we could do to make this easier. Um, and ultimately, what we should be looking for is to go towards semantic reporting. And that allows computers to figure out what you're doing as well. So to give you an idea, this is iPhoto. This is my iPhoto library. And if I put in, I'm looking for dogs, it will pull out photos of dogs. Uh, and then it goes into, do you want poodles? Do you want Eskimos? Um, uh, do you want hot dogs? Uh, so it can be fairly specific. Um, and right now in our pathology reports, we have none of that. But imagine how easy it would be if you could say, show me all the uh, malignant uh, neoplasms that I've diagnosed in the duodenum in the last six months. I mean, that would be a huge in terms of uh, future studies and cross-referencing cases and that sort of thing. Uh, so before I get to the thanks, and there's a lot of folks I need to thank, Dr. Culp, here's where I would love your input. So like I've mentioned, uh, Dr. Culp has not had a tremendous amount of background in synoptic reporting before, so I'm kind of hitting him with this, not completely de novo because he's been through this before, but from a clinician standpoint, what is your opinion of getting a report that looks like this? D does that, again, without having a lot of experience with them, does that make it easier for you as a clinician to figure out the stuff that you're interested in? Yeah, thanks so much, Mike. That was amazing. I love that. That's such a great overview. And I, I appreciate this. You know, I, in my limited time in talking with you, I've definitely become a convert to this. And, uh, you know, I, I really do appreciate this format. And I think as someone, um, you know, who, who looks at these and tries to make decisions from them, I, I do truly um, think this would be a, a system that we would like to adopt. Uh, that being said, I am a surgeon, so we're simple folk uh, as compared to the majority of the people on this talk here. But, um, you know, I think that it's something where we try to, when we have our tumor boards and we have our discussions with our medical oncologists and we're kind of going back and forth at, through reading these reports, these are, the, these are the topics that come up. These are the concepts and things that we have questions about, the things that are going to drive the next steps in what we recommend, whether they need more surgery, whether they need adjuvant therapy from there. So I think this is, um, this would be a, a step forward for me. And, and, you know, the other thing I think that you keep bringing up that's really important is the future studies and, and the ease in, in trying to identify those things. I think, you know, those are studies that those three groups work primarily on the pathologists, the oncologists and the surgeons who um, try to find and identify that information and then try to use that information in their in their studies in the future. And that's always a struggle for us is trying to specifically identify those types of cases. So I think that would be hugely important. Okay. So let me go through questions quickly and then uh, see how I'm doing on time. I, my hope was that I'd have enough time at the end to have a little bit of a discussion just because, uh, again, this is sort of an introduction to synoptic reporting, not a, um, uh, as opposed to the other folks who are presenting uh, a little more of a standardized thing. But before I do that, uh, let me just thank uh, all of these folks uh, have been important. Bruce, it's Bruce Williams' fault that I'm here. 
um, along with Don Mutin. Uh, those two are the ones who got me into this in the first place. Um, but Christoph uh, and Taryn have been hugely helpful in uh, developing this and bouncing ideas off of. Uh, Drew Miller, Francis Moore, and Pompey have been uh, excellent as well in, in fleshing these ideas out. I need to thank the Davis Thompson Foundation explicitly. Uh, they host the VCGP's website. Uh, obviously, as you can see from the, the web tools, uh, they also have all the tools on there. Uh, it's a little easier because I'm their webmaster, so uh, some of this is less a question and more uh, uh, thanks for letting me get away with this, but um, I, I do appreciate uh, Jay and Bruce and Paco's uh, willingness to let me go ahead and play with that. Um, and uh, from there, uh, I'm always looking towards the next generation. So I keep hoping I'm getting my daughter trained in reading my biopsies. And if I can make synoptic reporting easy enough, then I can just let her read out half my biopsies. Uh, and I, I can go, I don't know, sit down on the couch. But, uh, and then I think we've all felt like this before. So, uh, so let me start with uh, questions that were received. So the first question is, uh, synoptic report is possible only with informatic systems or databases with different schemes for each neoplastic entity. I don't know that I'd say you need information systems or databases, but we do need a separate scheme for each tumor or group of tumors. It has to be specific to what we're looking at because ideally you're going to be looking at what are the prognostic, what are the factors that have been found to be prognostic in that given tumor or set of tumors uh, and make sure that that gets reported out in every single case. So um, yes, it, is it possible to introduce synoptic reporting without an adequate system for tumors to begin with? And I think so, but I think what it ends up being is it's going to be that more generalized report where we pick some pieces of information that we all generally acknowledge are important sort of across the board mitotic count, uh, neoplastic margins, uh, you know, what, what is the histologic tumor-free distance, um, that sort of thing. Pick a small subset of things that are uh, important across a very wide swath of tumors and start with that. And then as we develop more tumor-specific guidelines, we set up separate tools for each of those. So that, that would be my answer to that. But obviously, uh, and importantly, it would be much better to have tumor-specific um, reports than just something that's, that's generally applicable, because that gets so broad that it's less helpful. Uh, next question. For those synoptic reports, is there a way to integrate the references for prognostic markers that are utilized in the actual output report? Um, is that something CAP does so the clinician can check out the cited reference to see why we used it and the data associated with it? That's a great question. Um, the way CAP works it is they have this whole list of things. Um, and then uh, let me back up. CAP has a group that comes up with each protocol. So it's experts in that tumor. And then they have another group that works on an information interchange and for anybody who's also a nerd, they have their own specific XML format. And I just put everybody else to sleep. So non-nerds, I apologize. Um, but they have their own CAP-specific XML schema to take their tumor checklists and put them into any computer system. But how that computer system then takes that and displays it is specific to each computer system. So. Epic or Cerner or any of the other human systems all deal with that in a completely separate way. They also, just for everyone's information, they also sell that. It's not free to get their XML schema. Uh, they're also not very responsive to veterinarians who ask them questions because I emailed them a few times trying to get more information and I never heard back from them. So, but um, could we do that? Sure. Um, how we do that would be up to us to decide. Um, but they also, I should say, in their long checklist, they have appendices, and in the appendices, they generally have references for um, prognostic factors. 
Um, but I think that's an excellent idea. And that was one of the things in the uh, adenocarcinoma example, each of those things where it says, here's the thing is a link to that paper. That my thought was that was for the pathologist so they could see how that works. But putting those links in for clinicians as well would be an excellent idea because I know that um, I forget references as well. And for private practitioners having, where can I find this would be excellent. Uh, someone asked, uh, is it possible to write a synoptic report in a language in other languages using the foundations report tool? Right now, let me answer that a couple different ways. The, the dumbest answer is no, because I, I, I honestly, my Spanish is horrible. My English isn't that great either, but uh, I don't know any other languages and I, I'm the one who's doing it. So that's the, the worst possible answer. Uh, but the, the better answer is we can write anything in any language if folks give me what to put in. So if somebody was available to translate it for me, uh, we would have to generate a tool that says, you know, synoptic report, Spanish, synoptic report, uh, Czechoslovakian, synoptic report, English. Um, so each of those specific tumor reports would have to be translated into another language, but we could easily do that. Um, that that's not that difficult. And generating new reports is also not that difficult. Uh, if using a synoptic report format, oh, I apologize, sorry. Uh, are, can, should data entered into a synoptic report be weighted? Well, that's also a good question. And to some degree that comes down to a discussion between pathologists and clinicians, because I, I think as pathologists, we are very involved in the report, which is understandable because that's our work output. But I think we need to look towards the end goal, which is what do we want the reports, what are the reports for? Why are we doing this? And the end goal is that report gets used in doing something else with the animal. Treatment, decision-making, prognosis, um, future care decisions, that sort of thing. So how these things get weighted, I, I think is a discussion we need to have with the clinicians who use our reports going forward to figure out what, what is important and, and how that gets weighted. Now, that also ties into things like grading and, and that sort of thing. And a synoptic report, if we have all the components to put in a grade, a synoptic report could be used to automatically calculate grades depending on how that goes. So um, that, that's certainly something we could do, but I, I think that is a very, it's a short question with a very complicated answer that I think needs a lot of collaboration. And honestly, I think synoptic reports are one of the areas where as a group of pathologists, we really need collaboration with clinicians as well, because I think their input is truly key to making these a useful resource. Uh, someone asked if using a synoptic report format, do you still include mitoses, margins, et cetera, in the description? Uh, I guess I tend to let people do their own thing. So I, could you? Sure. Do you have to? No. Uh, should we? I don't know. Uh, that, that would be something, I guess, for, again, the group to decide. Uh, I think everybody's going to have their own answer. In some ways, it's, it's almost as easy if, if you've been doing it for a while because you have that format. So you, you kind of, you know, you have your mental flow. And so adding those in is not a tremendous amount of work. On the other hand, I hate redundancy. And I try to make my reports as short as possible. So uh, my default answer would be no, you wouldn't put it in. But could you? Sure. Uh, so I, I don't know that there's a prescriptive answer. People do what they want. Uh, how could a synoptic report handle items that may be considered critical by oncologists, even if they have not uh, or not yet been documented to be prognostic? In vet med, this would be a significant customer service issue. Uh, the short answer is we can put anything we want in our synoptic reports because we generate the templates. And so if, if we as a profession think it's important, we could stick it in. The, this is something that's wide open to folks giving suggestions. And I, I agree, there's a lot of things that people expect and mitotic count is certainly one of them where it, it may not be prognostic in a lot of tumors, but people expect to see it. And so I think that we just need to make sure that 
again, in collaboration with clinicians and the folks who are the end users of our reports, that we are making our reports as, as useful to them as possible. So I think that's, that's important. Uh, next question, uh, in the reporting document, it said the biopsy reports had no delay in turnaround time, but the, the pathologist reported that the synoptic reporting took 25 to 50% longer to complete. Do you think the pathologists work longer hours or took fewer cases to maintain the same turnaround time? Honestly, the, the pathologist reported that synoptic reporting took longer is a self-report. It was not actually timed. So I think there was a perception that the reports took longer. I'm not sure that they actually did. And I think that's where that paper was going with that. Now that said, uh, a lot of the issues that people, that pathologists had when they switched over were issues with technology because it's changing how you're doing reports. It's going from just having a box you put text into to then having to click things and make sure you answer things correctly. And so I think a lot of the increase that was reported that, that was real was less of a problem with synoptic reports in general and more a problem with people trying to figure out how that works. And I think a lot of that, again, in informal talks with MDs, I think a lot of that pain has gone away because now everybody's used to it. Uh, they've all done it. Um, so I think that in some ways, the fact that we don't have tools to do synoptic reporting right off is in some ways a little bit of a benefit because we don't have that pain of everybody having to try and figure out five new tools to do that. Um, and someone mentioned uh, it would be great to get a clinical history in this type of format. I actually meant to bring this up earlier and I apologize. Dr. Fabricio Grande has been sending me messages about this um, before the talk uh, because he's been developing several of these types of reports himself for use in their practice. But one of the things he did that I really liked was having a synoptic um, submission type submission form for cytology for mammary tumors. So I think in a lot of ways, as we're coming up with synoptic reports, it would not hurt us to come up with a more standardized synoptic type submission as well. Coming up with what and not necessarily, oh, here's what our submission forms should all look like so they all look the same. But can we come up with, for a particular type of mass, can we come up with a set of information that we feel is important for us to receive and spell that out for people in the submission form so that it, it, it's really obvious what we're looking for? Um, I, I think that would be excellent and, and is, I agree. First of all, any kind of history would be uh, great to get, but uh, getting specific pieces of information would really be helpful uh, as well. Uh, shouldn't us, an appropriately designed synoptic report stand alone with also, without also including microscopic description? Is the hybrid example just to make us and clinicians feel better about the reporting? I would think an additional findings field could encompass any findings not captured in the designated parameters, which the pathologist feels might be important or unique. That's a great question. And I think it depends on where we go with synoptic reporting. So I'm just gonna pick mast cell tumors as an example. There's no space in mast cell tumor synoptic reports that I, I've seen or, or for things like eosinophils. Are there large numbers of eosinophils? That comes back to how well differentiated it is. So you could add that in, but do you want to have a specific thing that has to get answered every time for a number of, of eosinophils? Um, I guess in some ways that comes back to, do we need to have the microscopic description at all? Could we just put in the morphologic diagnoses and comments um, with a couple of parameters that are important? We could. So I, I don't know. I, I, I think that's somewhat of a individually dependent question. Some people are gonna feel uncomfortable if they don't give a microscopic description and some people don't care about the microscopic description components other than the ones that are incorporated by the synoptic report. Uh, so that's something that could be discussed and maybe that's something that could be on a lab by lab basis where if your lab wants to incorporate microscopic descriptions because they feel uncomfortable not having it or because they want to use that for resident training, um, or because they feel it's really important to have, great. If your lab feels that's unimportant and they just want the synoptic part, 
also great. Some of that may also come back to talking to clinicians as well. Um, and let me throw that to Dr. Culp. Dr. Culp, if you got just the top part of this report and with the morphologic diagnoses and comments, does that cover it for you, you think? Or would you feel more comfortable having the descriptive part as well? Yeah, I mean, for me, and I, I guess everybody's going to be a little bit different, but uh, I, I would like to have the descriptive part as well. I think that that does come up in a lot of our conversations during tumor boards, uh, as well as I think that does impact some of the recommendations that get made afterwards. Okay. But I, I think that's, again, an important conversation we need to have, not just as pathologists, but as a group of folks with um, pathologists and clinicians. And I realize I keep saying that over and over again, but I think this is really the interface between pathology and um, treatment and never ask a pathologist for a treatment plan. But we need to make sure that we don't make decisions unilaterally without consulting the folks who then take our reports and use them. Uh, any concern that synoptic reporting will promote tumor lumping and delay identification of parameters that might benefit from splitting a tumor into a separate prognostic category? I am a dedicated hardcore lumper if it has no prognostic relevance. So uh, uh, concern, maybe joy, uh, expectation, hope might be a better answer, but I realize for the splitters in the group, uh, that is not a pro. So um, I, I think it could be. But I think in some ways uh, that comes back to developing something that's specific for a given tumor or type of tumors. So um, as Don mentioned, if there are prognostic differences in um, separate soft tissue sarcomas, then I think that we need to find those prognostic differences before we make up a synoptic report that's specific to those. Um, I, on the other hand, if we put in everything that could possibly have prognostic relevance, I think there's a risk of making these reports unusable by diagnostic pathologists because there'd be so much information in there that you would have to put in for every tumor that it becomes unusable. So I think um, it, it kind of comes back to uh, there's always a, a pro and con of everything that we do. There's pros to having more information and there's definite cons. So I don't know. I think that's going to require some careful thought by the folks who are developing these. Um, but like I say, I think we could do a very generic, stripped down, bare bones format to start with that would cover everything. And then the folks who currently split or the folks who currently lump could do their thing in the descriptive parts. And then we could go back and, and sort that out as studies become available. But I think there's, there's uh, a, a lot that could be done as far as that. Uh, um, Dr. Derek, uh, I don't want to interrupt too much. Just a heads up, we are currently at running over into the break. Um, I apologize. Feel free, feel free to answer this question, but um, to, our, you know, just so you're aware. <laughs> I will cut it short then. Thank you. Um, how to evaluate standardization in relation to core biopsy and cell blocks in uh, sparing research methods? Uh, that's also a, a great question. Uh, I think that uh, for that, we would need to look at things like uh, as people develop protocols, how many fields, uh, how many, what kind of tissue area do we need to make this particular piece relevant? Or do we need to come up with something that's separate if we don't have a specific amount of tissue? Or are these parameters that are so uniform across these tumors that the area is not relevant? Uh, I think that's an excellent question. And I think that would need to be looked into in developing those protocols. So. All right. Well, thank you folks very much for your time. I really appreciate it. It's been an honor to get to present with such an august group of people and Don. And uh, uh, thank you. I, I look forward, if you have suggestions, if you're interested in participating, please let us know because there's a lot to be done. And uh, I would uh, love to have people who are interested participate.